Good morning, everyone. Welcome to A Blaze. We're so glad that you're here this morning. I appreciate the several claps I got in the audience. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, we are so glad you're here this morning. We're glad you're joining us as we continue on with the Baltimore Catechism, our focus on sacraments and prayer. And we are just excited to see the room filled up. And we're excited to be back together again as we enter into fall. Happy fall, y'all. It is, it is officially fall. Yeah, yeah, we have to be fall, y'all. Absolutely. We're in the South, right? Um, we're so glad you are here. There's a lot coming up in the church, and there's a lot of um, lessons we have before us. So I just wanted to draw your attention first to the schedule so you're aware. We are obviously, next week will be October. We'll be entering the month of the Holy Rosary and Respect Life Month. And so um, we will be focused on baptism on October 1st. But then October 8th, we will be out. We will not be here for a blaze. But we need all of you here anyway because it's the blood drive. And they are in desperate, desperate need. So if you are interested in participating in that, we need your help. Please go to St. Monica's website and go ahead and sign up to be part of the blood drive. And you can save up to six lives. Six babies could be saved just by you giving a little bit of your time. And who doesn't want to help with that, right? So please consider doing that. This morning, the breakfast that you provided, let's put your hands together for the people in the kitchen who provided a beautiful breakfast for us this morning. We have gratitude this morning for our Holy Family Prayer Group, and we have with us the illustrious Tom Walker. Yeah, yeah, come on up, sir. And uh, he's going to share with us, come on, yes, he needs a really big round of applause. Tom Walker, come on. <laughs> Can you share with us a little about the uh, Holy Family Prayer Group, please? Why, certainly. <laughs> the uh, Holy Family Prayer Group meets the fourth Thursday evening at 6.30 of every month, except during the summer. And uh, we have a potluck dinner. Uh, Arlene Butler makes food to die for. So She probably makes food for everyone, for, knowing for, Arlene. She, she can feed an army, yes. Yes. And um, we, uh, we pray the rosary together as a group. We uh, say the Litany of St. Joseph, and we do Alexio Divina uh, as a group on the upcoming gospel. And everyone in a parish is welcome, especially families and with children. Um, just yesterday morning at That Man Is You, Harold Bur Deacon Harold gave a uh, great uh, talk on David and Goliath, and David's Sling and his five stones are a type of the rosary. The rosary is a sling and the five mysteries are the stones that make the devil go, ow, stop that. But um, the power, when people get together and pray the rosary, uh, the power of that is unbelievable. So uh, that's why we do it and uh, it's great fellowship. So there's a meeting this week? We're meeting this Thursday, yes. And it'll so, be in this room? It will be, yes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We hope that others will be able to join. I'm sure Arlene will be bringing her best this week because she always brings enough for everybody. No, she's not going to be here? Sorry. What's okay, really exciting, yeah. uh, Annie, is I'll be there. Of course. <laughs> and, of course, we'll be so excited that Tom will be there to greet each of you and share with you his wisdom, right? That's right. Thanks, All right. thanks everybody. Try well, the fish. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, particularly to the Holy Family Prayer Group for the beautiful breakfast before you. Again, if you didn't have an opportunity to put a donation in the basket as you walk through, please make sure that you do so on the way out. Again, each uh, apostolate that provides breakfast, they pay for that out of their own budget. So we want to make sure that we um, reimburse them for that, for what they provide for us. So thank you again to everybody in the kitchen on that. A couple of things I want to share with you. Did you know this year is very important because it's the National Eucharistic Revival? We're focused on the Eucharist. We know, as we talked about last week, that the Eucharist is the source and summit of all that we know. And so we want to make sure that everyone in the world understands that that is a belief that we hold. And uh, so the National Eucharistic Summit will be, or the revival will, is this year. And we've had um, Father Milady come and talk to us as one of the events we're having. We'll have several other events, I'm sure, throughout the year. And there will be an, actually a big convention in Indianapolis this year to focus on that. So just some things to think about. And 
Um, there's a video that I will be sharing on our Ablaze page that is just very impactful. It shares uh, an event that happened in our country when Pope John Paul went to go visit um, one of our seminaries, and uh, they sent in some dogs to just clear and make sure that it was it was okay. And it was rescue dogs, and they literally stopped in front of the tabernacle and pointed that there was someone in the tabernacle. So pretty powerful to see that. Um, a couple other things to mention for you. It's a very busy October. As I mentioned, it's Respect Life Month. So we will be obviously focused on our mother and on the rosary. There is the blood drive, as I, know, as I mentioned, uh, on October 7th. It is Our Lady of the Rosary, and we'll be hosting a rosary event. There will be details coming soon from Cindy Ferjuali about that. And um, let's see what else is going on. The newcomers reception. If you're new to the parish, is anybody new to the parish? If you are, raise your hand. Wow, okay, we're all good. Then we still need you here, though. October 17th, we want to welcome everyone new to the par parish. So if you have the opportunity, please come to that event. Or if you run an apostolate, they really want you to be there as well. There is so much going on in this busy, busy parish, and we're just blessed that we're able to do that. Um, so for the time right now, I think we're going to call up Father Jack if he's ready. Are you ready, Father Jack? Oh, okay. So we'll stretch. Tom, come on up, and we can, um, <laughs> we're going to bring Father Jack up and move on. Here we go. I'm not ready for everything, but God is. So, oh, does anyone need this on the table? I took this from the table. Sorry. But I should have done it. I have one up. Okay, so, oh, and that event, by the way, I, I don't know whether it's true or not, but anyway, that very place I was there, that event where they talk about the Pope going in with the guard dog. So he was in, uh, it was in Baltimore, and he was riding around. His, he's riding around his vehicle. It's a long, exhausting day, and I'm from Mount St. Mary's. There's a St. Mary's in um, Baltimore, and we, as Mount St. Mary's, were coming down to visit there. They didn't have many seminarians, but we had lots of seminarians. Um, being a nice, solid Orthodox seminary. And so uh, we came down, and it happened that he was going to visit us as part of the day. So uh, he came, and uh, he, here's what he taught us. Before he said anything to us, he walked right past us or walked right into St. Mary's Chapel and knelt before Jesus, and then he came and talked to us. All right. I mean, it... It, the, the few the few moments I saw when he was so old he could barely walk I remember him at consecration still genuflecting because I stood as a deacon next to him while he celebrated mass and it both of those things were the greatest instruction I ever received from that holy father and from my own father which was we go to mass every week why not because of the the great personality of the priest or anything like that. We go there because Christ is present in the Blessed Sacrament. I learned that from my earthly father and I learned that from the Holy Father. And that's the most important structure I ever receive or ever will receive. And if I instruct you in that way, that's I've done my job. Okay, so, but anyway, that's, it's, I was there at that moment. I was there when the dogs knelt before the Lord. I was there. And when the guard dogs... Okay, so here we go. Um, we are going to pray in the nomine patri sefidi et spiritus santi. Amen. And we're going to call the Holy Spirit to come upon us here as we're gathered over some good food uh, with prayerful people, with the uh, families and everything. So let us pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The saint in virtue is Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, I, the most profound meeting I had with her was I spent a summer in the mountains where these uh, sisters had little huts and they had the Blessed Sacrament in the huts and they adored Jesus and did their work in front of Jesus. They were given permission to do this. So I was up in the mountains of New York and it was awesome. It was so beautiful. And I was living in a little hut and just uh, I, all I did was read scripture the whole summer. And so uh, 
a friend of mine was ordained, and he had come up to visit these sisters. They were so wonderful. And uh, he was coming up to celebrate one of his first masses. And so he came up the mountain. I was about at the end of my time up there. And he said, hey, listen, Mother Teresa's in the Bronx. Do you want to go see her? I said, yeah. Now, this is before uh, Google and everything. And I followed him in my car without any instructions to the Bronx, to the house where the missionaries of charity were, which is the most harrowing experience of my life. If you've ever, if you've ever driven, driven in the Bronx, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. So, but anyway, there she was, Mother Teresa, and I got to hold the patent underneath her chin when she received the Blessed Sacrament. And then I was able to talk with her afterwards, and she was amazing. It was just amazing to talk to. You knew she was going to be a saint then, right? So, so anyway, Mother Teresa, this is so beautiful. What? So simple. It just took it real She had a call within a call. She had uh, entered in a religious life. She was teaching uh, wonderful uh, girls in India at a Catholic school. And then she looked outside of the walls because they were the privileged uh, Indians in her country and noticed all the poor. And she began to have a heart for the poor and felt called when she was sick. She was called by God while she was ill to serve the poorest of the poor, to love Christ and the poor. And so she went outside of that comfortable life as a sister and she went and served the poorest. And many of the girls in her school followed her. They followed her from the comfort that they had as privileged children in India to serve the, the, the most miserable, those dying on the streets. And uh, it's so beautiful because many of the sisters that you'll see uh, are Indian. Now, in fact, Mother Teresa was Albanian. Okay, she wasn't Indian. So many people think she was, but she wasn't. Uh, but it's a beautiful movement, a wonderful movement of heart, very elemental, very simple, very practical faith, which is I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was sick, I was unsheltered, I was naked, and they, they do all the work. They do all the work. So it's beautiful. And she uh, she can get anyone to do I I remember I went and helped the sisters, and she said, this man over here, you will wash him everywhere. You mean like, yeah, everywhere, especially here. I die, die. And sometimes he bites. I ah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so anyway, Mr. of Charity can get you to do things and to go places you never thought you would go and to do things you never thought you would do. Um, and, and it's just because they're so convicted. They have no doubt. You're here. You're a male. We don't wash males. You wash males. You're going to do this. Okay. Thank you, sister. <laughs> As if I had any say in the whole matter. Okay. So there you go. Very concrete, beautiful. Virtue of hope. She always brought hope wherever she was, even in the streets of despair. So she goes, and the first person she ministered to was so close to death that her maggots were crawling on his body. She took his body, removed the magnets, washed him, cleaned him, talked to him, and he knew who he was loved before he died. But he was abandoned by everyone else, right? So that's what she did. Very practical. Very concrete. Okay, true, false. Now, is this including true, false, and presentation, right? Is that what we got all, all in one big pack? One bundle, as they do? They bundling? Okay, you guys are bundling? Okay, so now these, uh, listen to these carefully. Number one, a human person, a human, a human is a person, but an angel is not. True or false? False. Angels are persons. They're purely spiritual persons. Humans are persons. They are both spiritual and bodily, okay? But we're both persons. Uh, number two, when Adam and Eve were created, they were like God because he made them with the gift of grace. True or false? True. Like God, grace is what makes us like God. We reflect God. Okay, so... It is by grace, not by disobedience, that we are like God. Satan says, don't you want to be like God? Be disobedient to him. That's not how you're, the way you're like God is by God's grace. Okay, and then cooperating with that grace. Number three, Adam and Eve were the first created persons to fall into sin. True or false? False, because the first created persons to fall into sin, now that you know the first answer, is Satan and his minions. So all the angels that fell into sin were the first persons. Anna, are you having fun here? I'm, I'm really ripping you up over there, aren't I? So. She says, I've taken his classes, too. That's what's so ridiculous. I keep throwing these curveballs every time. Number four, since the fall of Adam and Eve, every human that dies turns into an angel. Is that true or false? No matter what a wonderful life says, you don't get angels' wings in heaven. I'm sorry. Okay? 
uh, you're a human person, what you'll do is get a resurrected body at the, at the end of time, right? If you depart and you're holy, your soul goes up to the altar in heaven and you go as a soul up to heaven, but you're awaiting the resurrection of the body when God will take that genetic material out of the ground and build that up around your body so you have a glorified body. So you not only have the intensive experience of heaven, but the extensive experience of heaven through your body also. Number five, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. True or false? True. We say that in the creed. Listen to the creed, which you'll say today. The Father, the Son, this is number six, and the Holy Spirit comprise the three parts of God. True or false? False. There aren't three parts to God. There are, <laughs> I throw this one out every, and I get people every time. It, it, don't look at the clover or whatever St. Patrick was doing. They're not three parts to God. There is one God in three persons, all eternal persons, all forever. There wasn't, you know, so uh, they're all uh, fully God. Number seven, since we cannot see the Holy Spirit, he is symbolized by images such as fire, a cloud, and a dove. True or false? True indeed. We cannot see the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, but we can see stuff that indicates he's present. And number eight, the Father existed first the son came into existence second and the holy spirit came into existence third true or false false no arians in this room no arians in this room praise god that's good no they were uh, eternal always they were all the son was always with the father and the holy spirit was with the son and all they're always been there okay uh number nine grace always operates the same in every person on earth true or false false say uh, the way grace operates in, uh, in Mother Teresa is different than the way it operates in me. It's different than the way it operates in you. Different charisms, different talents, different capacities. I'm a little uh, shot glass uh, uh, capable of, of holding that much grace. And Mary is the super sizer. She's like 64 ounces, a little more than that. So some ridiculously gargantuan size that I can't imagine. Okay, so capacity, uh, charisms, what you're called to do, vocation, states of life, etc. You receive grace from God. It's all from God, but all of us respond differently to that grace. And that's what makes for the variety. The sameness of God leads to the variety of those created by God, okay? You don't begin with diversity. That's The culture says, hey, let's be, all be diverse. We'll get together and we'll fit together. No, no, no. You begin with God who is ultimately simple, and all diversity flows from the simplicity of God. You need to remember that because everything in the culture is so goofy. The church does not talk about diversity. It talks about, well, the faithful church does not talk about diversity. It talks about charisms and talents and members and states in life and hierarchy. That's what it talks about. Okay, There's a way God has constructed our relationships, right? So number one, we're going to go now. Oh, wait a minute. Number 10, it is impossible for a person outside of the state of grace to be affected by grace, true or false? False. So it is sanctifying grace is to be in a state of grace. If you lose that, you may receive actual grace to draw you to sanctifying grace. So, I mean, in other words, you commit a mortal sin and your conscience goes, oh, man, I feel so bad. I'm going to say an act of contrition. I'm going to get to confession. That's actual grace. You're not in a state of grace, but you feel so awful where you are that actual grace is making you feel that awfulness. Okay, that means you're sensitive to sin. To not be sensitive to sin is a sad thing, right? You don't have actual grace operating on you to move you towards Jesus, to move you towards the healing waters. Okay, so now we're moving into the lesson, grace from God and evil from Satan. That's pretty easy. Uh, Adam is... The Lord formed man, Adam, of dust from the ground and breathed his, in his nostrils the breath of life. So he's formed from the ground. This makes us bodily, but he's uh, inspired with the spirit. That makes us also spiritual. We're a mixture of those two. In our nature, we're both body and soul complete. The Holy Spirit is the breath of life. It's the presence of grace. In that breathing into us, that soul is the part of us that is like God. It's by grace that we are like God. Our body images God. And so it's like, it's like if you have this software, you put it into computer, and then the computer images stuff. It shows it to you. Well, that's, we're kind of like those two things. We have the, the software and we have the hardware, okay? And, and the software is supposed to reflect through the hardware. The hardware is not supposed to drive everything, right? 
And so this is what God has given into us, that invisible uh, life force within us that you can see depart when somebody dies. The gift of grace is what? Truth, male, female, called to be one body. The truth for life, it was painlessness. It was control of passions. We didn't have disordered passions. It was great knowledge. Our intellectual capacity was great. It was very firm, very clear. Uh, Our emotions were ordered. Our body was healthy, not prone to death. All these things. Well, Satan comes. Fall of Adam under Satan. Satan falls, then he comes out of envy to attack Adam. You have the loss of the Holy Spirit and grace. So sanctifying grace is lost. The preternatural gifts of grace are lost. And Satan's gifts, what does he give? He gives us lies instead of truth. He gives us death instead of life. He gives us suffering instead of painlessness. He gives us slavery to passions instead of control of passions, ignorance and error instead of knowledge. What a deal, huh? <laughs> what a deal. Y'all ready to go join the Luciferians now? All they say. I was, I was listening today about um, one of these great uh, uh, guys, you know, working for Davos. He was saying, you know, all these people have their religions, and they say that God gave them this message. And he says, you know, all those are limited messages, but we can create an AI, and from that AI, they can actually give us a Bible that really would be a message that does not come from humans. We would create what would give us a message. We would create God. It's basically saying that. I, I'm not lying to you. I I wish I were making this up. But the person saying all these other things fall short because these humans claim that this comes from God. But we could create something that's beyond any of our capacities and it could give us something greater that, than us. Even though we created it. I'm, I'm not lying to you people. I'm not. Okay. P- people are preparing to, to put stuff, put, you know, stuff into, so we can be cyborgs. And eventually cyborgs become borborgs or sci size. I don't know what. They'll have a new pronoun vocabulary at that point. Okay, so the fall of Adam under Satan. Loss of Holy Spirit. All these different terrible things. Now, redemption, because of the fall, God lifts us up out of mercy. He didn't have to. In justice, we deserved damnation. But in mercy, he gave us salvation. The power of the Holy Spirit. So the restorations of life and the Holy Spirit with the seven gifts and the restoration of virtue. So think about this. You have the seven virtues. You have the, the, the seven um, sacraments. What's that reflecting? God created the world in seven days, and he's now giving us a new creation. He's giving us a new order of grace. So the first order has fallen, but the new order in the order of grace, not the great reset, not the globalist cause, but the universalist cause of Catholicism, that's basically a revolution within every nation where we belong under the King Jesus and living under the King Jesus. We change everything in that culture for the better rather than for the worse. That's what Christ did. That's what he established, a global revolutionary force to go and convert everyone to be children of God and followers of Christ the King. It, we're revolutionary. We're revolution. We should be. We, we should be so dangerous that even like the FBI would come after us. Oh, okay, good, good. This is. No, I mean, seriously, when I look at that, I go like, oh, man, we got to be right. I mean, everyone hates us. And it's like, it's, it's like we got to be on the right side. There's no way. There's no way you could be on the wrong side. <laughs> when guys are coming in with guns, they're like pointing, you know, and looking at, oh, you know, you voted for this person, we're going to get it. It's like ridiculous, right? But I'm telling you right now, you, it gets clearer that you're on the right side because of who your enemies are, Okay. Because you go like, seriously, those enemies, you go like, you want to join them? Do you want to live the way they're living? You want to have their priorities? You know, you go like, no, it's not appealing, right? And I think that's important, which is, you know, sometimes if children, we ought to help them see, okay, if you fall, this is what you get. This is what people are, this is what's going to happen to you, okay? No heaven, trying to create a heaven on earth just creates a hell. That's what's happening. Okay, so... Uh, restoration of the Holy Spirit, and you have the essential gifts of grace, actual and sanctifying. The Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and the Son. It's the third person of the Blessed Trinity. Now, the reason we're bringing this up is the uh, importance of the Holy Spirit and of grace in all the sacraments that we'll be discussing. 
He proceeds in the Father and the Son as the mutual love. You see this, like, when you, when you hear the, the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom with the, the Spirit of love, the Spirit of truth, okay, or the Spirit of life. All these aspects that we associate with Christ, too, because basically the two hands of God the Father are the Spirit and the Son. And he's recreating everything with these two hands, the Spirit and the Son, okay? So the Holy Spirit's role in salvation, it dwells in the church as her source of life. It's like the soul of the church. It sanctifies souls through the gift of grace. All the souls of the body of Christ are sanctified by the Spirit, which is the soul of the church as one body. The church is the mystical body of Christ. Christ is the head. Christians are members of his body. The Holy Spirit is the soul of the church, the Lord, the giver of life, to be in a state of grace. The Holy Spirit is the fire of God's love. Think about this. When you see Moses in the burning bush, the pillar of fire, what are you seeing? You're seeing a prefigurement of Mary, wherein the Holy Spirit dwells in her but doesn't burn her up. She remains a fruitful tree from which fruit will come. Okay? Uh, and Christians, now God can dwell in us by God's grace, and we don't die. Remember in the Old Testament, when you saw God, if just if you saw God, you die. Now God dwells in us, and we dwell in God, and we'll see God with beatific vision and have eternal life. Not die, but have eternal life. And even death, which is a curse given to us on earth, leads to life eternal. Okay, so uh, Christ comes and conquers all the problems that we face in the power of the Holy Spirit. With Christ, burning hearts, Emmaus and Pentecost. What is it? Were our hearts not burning? You're not talking about like they had a little bit too much hot sauce or chili or something like that. You know, it's like, no, our hearts are, we, we knew when we walk along, something was going on here. We, he was talking to us and, and the gospel was making sense and we were just like really moved. Just something powerful was going on. And, and how, how did they know him? Did they know, it's a, you know, at the end of the road to Emmaus. We knew him in the opening of the King James Version of the Bible. No, no. We knew him in the breaking of the bread uh, where he, in the context of the mass, explains the word of God, which was not even written at the time. Right? We know him in the breaking of the bread. It's like, is that simple enough for you? Come on. Sola Eucharistia. Okay. So uh, anyway, there you go. Hey, I got to come up with my new Protestant term. I'm becoming a Protestant within the Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, so anyway, there we go. Now, so the Holy Spirit then becomes like almost our clothing or our indwelling, an interior light for those raised in glory to heaven. So we're burning with the Holy Spirit. Or we're, when you see Mary, she's clothed in the sun. It's like, well, that would burn somebody up. Not her because she's like the burning bush that was seen by Moses. God could actually be there and it's not burning up because it's just dwelling. And it actually becomes, instead of in hell, the fire of God burns you. In heaven, the fire of God is your life. Okay, it's how you exist. Okay, so there we go. Uh, punishment, darkness, and pain for the damned in hell. So again, the fire of God, which is the love of God, burns those who are evil because what is it? They hate love, and love burns them. Okay, they hate love. We love love, and because we love, I mean, now I'm sounding really goofy. I, the culture says love is love. I say, no, your, your love is not love. But God is love. And if we love love, we love God. And God will dwell in us so that we can love the way he wants us to love by his indwelling. We're loving God by the power he gives us of grace, okay? So this is what we're called punishment, darkness, and pain for those. Who, I don't want that. Grace for our salvation. What do we do? We're redeemed from our fallen state and we're sanctified to be perfected. So we're redeemed. We are now brought into this new state of grace. But then we have to cooperate with grace. That's sanctification or divinization. Okay? So, a supernatural gift of the Father. It's bestowed on those through the merits of Christ the Son. And it's sustained and active in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. When I'm cooperating with grace, I'm cooperating with the Holy Spirit. I'm reflecting Jesus. And I'm a child of God the Father. That's what's happening. Sanctifying grace confers on us new life, sharing in the life of God. The Father is the origin of life. The Son is the way, the truth, and the life. The Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life. All of them operate as life because they are life. I am who am. 
They exist. That's their being. Okay? The effects. It makes us holy and pleasing to God. It makes us adopted children of the Heavenly Father as members of His Son's body. It makes us temples of the Holy Spirit. And it gives us the right to heaven. State of grace. If you're in a state of grace and you die, okay, let me in. Let me in. Peter, get out of the way. Why? Because you have access. You have access because you have lived in the justification that Christ has given you. You're justified by his blood. I mean, you know, people say, I've been washed clean in the blood of the lamb. I said, no, you haven't. It, it, well, maybe your baptism, but what about the Eucharist? How are you getting the application of that blood from the cross of Calvary? We're applying it at every Mass. We're applying the blood of the Lamb at every Mass. You talk about the blood of the Lamb, we have the blood of the Lamb. We don't even have to talk about the blood of the Lamb. We actually receive the blood of the Lamb. You do that every time you receive the most blessed sacrament, okay? The actual grace is a supernatural help of God to enlighten the mind. I need all the enlightenment I can get. To strengthen our will to do good and avoid evil, I need strength of will. The necessity of actual grace for those who have attained the age of... Listen, when your child is seven, they need actual grace to resist the powers of temptation. No, no stealing out of the cookie jar to perform those actions which merit or Go clean your room. Pray as parents. Actual grace, come down upon my child. Actual grace, please, spirit, dwell on my child so they'll go make their bed and make it look decent. Please, Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen, brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit and grace are gifts from the Father through the Son, which we can either accept at Chipite or reject. Basically, it's all available. Doors open. Okay? The Holy Spirit and grace are necessary for supernatural life in heaven, but when ultimately lost through mortal sin, this loss results in spiritual death and the pains of hell. And the only way to restore that dead soul is through reconciliation in the sacrament of reconciliation or perfect contrition. If uh, when you cannot receive that gift, if you are about ready to die and you know you had a serious sin on your soul, say, God, I love you and I'm sorry for what I've done. And if I survive this, I will do everything I can to get to confession as soon as possible. And please, I'm sorry. And principal ways of obtaining grace. Prayer, sacraments, merit and grace, works of mercy, daily activities as offerings to God through the sacrifice of his son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, um, it's so awesome, the grace of God that we receive, the gifts and access we have. We need all the sacramentals. We need all the sacramental care. Each of us, uh, those of you who are married, living according to the grace of your sacrament, as I reminded you last week, what's one of those graces? To put up with the weakness in your spouse. That, that's basically a merit counseling. Listen, my husband does it. Uh, my wife does it. Yeah, mm, sure. You have grace to put up with that. I am a celibate man. I've heard your complaint. Go home. And endure the weaknesses of your spouse. Amen. Okay, so each of us has each of us has our own crosses. Okay, so but nonetheless, you remember when you were married, it was an intersection of, of and you made the cross. You know, okay, so there you go. That's it. And what's at the center of that cross? The heart of Jesus. And what? It's pierced. Okay, it's pierced. You duped me, Lord. That's what happens every morning when you wake up. You do me, Lord. Okay, that's the life of a priest, too, but it's great duping, let me tell you. Okay, so here we are. Annie's coming up. We got a question, and, and whatever, however, I'll just do whatever these guys over here tell me to do. Okay, thank you. <laughs> People don't realize it's like a stand-up routine up here sometimes with Father Jack. You never know what you're going to get in a blaze. It'll be about cyborgs and hot sauce, Latin lessons, and then he, you know, tells you how wonderful it is to be married. So <laughs> it, it is a full load for us to take as we go on today. Um, this is the point we have table talk. So we're going to throw up a question on the screen here for you all to discuss at your table for the next five minutes. Um, and there's also still food available in the kitchen if you are interested or hungry, if you're not headed to 1045 Mass. So let's look to our question that he's provided for us today. Why is actual grace important for unbaptized souls or souls who have committed mortal sin? What signs would indicate to an observant Catholic that actual grace is operative in a soul outside the Catholic Church? So we're going to let you 
go ahead and discuss that question in the very uh, short five minutes. I'm sure you guys can answer it like that. And we will be back up. Father Jack will take some questions too. So we will be back. Have we figured it out yet? Have you figured it out how some of our Protestant brothers and six sisters have signs indicating their grace? Father Jack's still giving a lesson over here on his own table. <laughs> We're going to, first of all, another round of applause for the kitchen. Thank you for our, minute, our apostolate today. We are very grateful for them to provide breakfast for us. Again, we will be back next week, and we hope you will be here with us. And we're going to let Father Jack explain this question to us, and then we're going to take questions, right? Exactly. Yeah, right. I, I actually asked the question in a really poor way. Something I was pointing to, and I want to encourage you in, which is this. A lot of times I can see people, they're, they're working, they love Jesus. we got to plant the Catholic seed, which is to say something like, hey, we pray a rosary. Do you know what that is? Um, you know what? If you're disturbed, we have this adoration chapel. Why don't you just stop by and sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament? We got to get down because what we're doing is we're always working on the level of like, oh, well, they believe this. They, this is really nice and everything. But what we need to do is if I believe that Jesus is present in that tabernacle, I should be saying to somebody, hey, listen, I know you're distressed. Just come here and you'll find some peace. Um, listen, there is the mother of God. She, she's actually talked. People will be open to this. They'll start moving towards the Catholic position because it makes a lot more sense. It gets a lot more consolation. And At least it does for me. Okay, so, I mean, I'm crazy enough, but if I weren't Catholic, I'd be more crazy. Okay, we have questions out there. Yes? I think we've got a question over here. No, we don't. He, he just he he's going like this. He's question. going like I could have had a VA. Oh, of course. Anna's got a question. Come on, Anna. Okay. So, you hear a lot about the sacrifice of the Mass. Yes. Could you please put that in layman terms? Well, I do in every homily, but here I'm going to say it again. Okay. When you come to the sacrifice of the Mass, what is it? It's the sacrifice of Calvary applied to us. That was bloodily. It was a bloody sacrifice on Calvary back in the past. In an unbloody manner, it's applied to us. What that means is the sacrifice of the Son, Jesus, where he died for our sins to make reparation for the sins and to give us life and a relationship back to God the Father. When you receive that as supper in Holy Communion, you're receiving a sacrifice. What does that mean? You're receiving the son sacrificed for our sins. And what you can do now is this. Before you receive, what does the priest invite you to do? Lift your hearts up to the Lord. What are you doing? I desire, you know, your will. I desire your mercy. I desire. He's wanting us to give us his will. Give our wills through the will of the son, Jesus, the sacred heart to the father. And when we lift our hearts up to the Lord... What we're doing is we are now going to be offering sacrifice to the Father. What is sacrifice? Not my will, but thy will be done. So what you're sacrificing all the time is my will. You're doing it through the sacred heart. You're doing it through his pierced heart on the cross where the obedience of the last Adam reverses the disobedience of the first Adam. You as a child of the first Adam by baptism are incorporated into the last Adam and he nourishes that obedience to God because at the Mass, you're receiving sacrificial supper. You're receiving the perfect sacred heart of God in your heart so that he takes your stony heart and gives you the heart of Jesus. So what does that mean? Now, I am glorifying the Father by offering my life to him. How do I offer my life to him? I do this by obeying him and by serving others. So, the hungry, the poor... They say, this is the sacrifice. Okay, so we often look at, oh, I sacrificed today. I didn't do it. I sacrificed. No, no, no. The sacrifice is the sacrifice, which is the son of God on the cross of Calvary. We are either united to that sacrifice or we're not. If we're united to the sacrifice, what are we saying? Thy will, Father, be done how? On earth, how were we made from dirt on earth? 
as it is in heaven. How are we as dirt doing it on earth? Because we have souls. We're, we are actually personal dirt, okay? I mean, why was it that, you know, when Jesus, uh, when they touched the Ark of the Covenant, the person dies, okay, but, and the Ark falls into the dirt. Now, why did it do that? The dirt wasn't offending God as much as that person who sinned, because dirt can't sin, but I can sin. The ark would rather fall in the dirt than for me to touch it because my sins are disobedient. The dirt's not being disobedient to God, <laughs> okay? But I've been disobedient to God as dirt with a soul. Isn't that, isn't that a cool, I, I forget where I heard that before, but I liked it. It wasn't my idea. Anyway, almost anything I say of any intelligence up here is a recycled idea from somebody I forgot. <laughs> And any absolute lunatic idea, that's my idea. <laughs> you can just say, well, that was Father Jack, and he's a lunatic. Okay, try not to get confused between the two. All right, what other questions do we have out there? Oh, we have. Here we go again. Oh, he's gonna, you're not going to give me another tough question like it's going to get me canceled by uh, you know, the church or anything like that, are you? No. The I Polish would... are always big problems, you know. <laughs> that's all I got to say. You know, John Paul II, I would still be teaching middle school if it wasn't for John Paul II. All right, go ahead. So my question is, why are there so many Catholics that believe in the Protestant rapture? Uh, because they're poorly formed, right? I, I, I don't even see the appeal of the rapture, right? I, I had a young man in my middle school talking about that. Um, I think it's because, particularly here in the South, in the United States, we live in what's called the Bible Belt which means we take the Bible and beat each other over the head with it with our misinterpretation. Um, but anyway, that I think what it is is we live in a Protestant culture, and Catholics actually usually do not learn Scripture from a Catholic vantage. They usually join non-Catholic groups, and they learn it from Protestant vantage, which is, is actually doesn't have that overview of tradition to form it or deposit of faith uh, to structure it. And so any belief that somebody, what will happen is somebody really believes that strongly says it to you, and then suddenly you're ready to be driving your car and just be lifted up to heaven. I, it's, but you go, for most of us, we go like, that's just absurd anyway, right, on the face of it. Okay, so, but anyway, I'd say it's just poor formation and individual interpretation of Scripture and not knowing how to put things together. It, it, I was raised this way. In the South, like I remember my sister, like reading something like the great, late great planet Earth or something. Like you were reaching out for spiritual things because we weren't fed with spiritual things from the church. They kind of take, there wasn't a Baltimore catechism. There wasn't, we were just kind of going on fumes, and those fumes a lot of times were, were Protestant fumes, right? Okay, so we're really trying to get a tact on that, a beat on that, but I think it's basically because of ignorance in a Protestant uh, milieu here. I've got a question for you, Father Jack. As we enter October and the month of Mary and the Rosary, oh, yes. um, I know that a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters take objection to us praying the Rosary. Sure. So how would you suggest we respond to those who say that we are dishonoring God by praying the Rosary? Or how, how would you The way that? I would say that is actually you're dishonoring God by not praying the Rosary. And so to honor the Son of God, Jesus, who gave Mary as his mother, you should actually pray the rosary because you're remembering Jesus through the heart of his mother. And so from the cross of Calvary, where we receive the blood of the Lamb God that's actually distributed at Holy Mass at the Catholic Church, where we honor Mary because we're honoring Jesus who gave us not only his body, blood, soul, and divinity, but his mother to us, we're remembering that mother and we're remembering the son, we remember the son best through the heart of the mother. And so actually, you're going to actually have a much, you, you claim to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Well, guess what? I have a more personal relationship with Jesus than you ever could think about. Don't say it that way exactly. But, <laughs> but, but I, I, I think what it is is like, really, you, you, if you have a close relationship to Mary, you have to have a closer relationship to Jesus. And you have no, you're getting a better information from the love and truth from her heart the wisdom, sede sapientiae, the seed of wisdom, then you would, you know, so, now nah, it's just like, I just, I just flip it over, say, no, no, actually, you are offending Christ egregiously by offending his mother, by not honoring her the way you're supposed to, in, in a gentle way. Thank you. You're <laughs> in a, could you imagine me doing that in a gentle way? 
No, no, I think maybe in a humorous way sometimes and stuff. But we just, the thing is, I think we need to loosen up with our, our, our separate, just tell them what we do. Here's how we do it. And, and we love it, and, and we love Mother Mary, and, and our lives are, are joyful, and we know how to go through sorrows, and we have beautiful funerals and beautiful weddings and beautiful baptisms. And, and what, yeah, it's just like I, half the time we're not telling people why my life is so great. I, I, that's what I don't get. It's like I, I wouldn't trade my life as a priest for any life. You know, it's like, well, what? That, I think, is part of the, the greatest evidence, which is like, I wouldn't walk around without my rosary, you know? Why not? Because, are you kidding me? Sca- scapular? Put on every morning, right? How many people have a scapular on in here? Not to shame anybody doesn't have it on. This is okay. But I would encourage you to get uh, enrolled in the scapular and have that on every day, right? Even if it's a little bit itchy, it's okay. Uh, you, it's, oh, Mary, Mother of God. You just remember that, right? Okay, everybody stand up. We're going to go to our Mass here. Let's, all these people working so hard to set this up, please let them help, help them after this, take down tables, do stuff like this. Um, and let us pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, uh, we thank you for the Holy Roman Catholic Church. We thank you for our lives as Catholics. We ask for blessings upon us and the entire world through the sacrifice of the Mass. We entrust this day uh, to the intercession of Mary, our mother, our spiritual mother. As we pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. All right, everybody have a great week. See you next week, right? We're coming next week. Okay.